Good afternoon. Africa is receiving a tremendous amount of the world's attention right now. The lions are roaring. Africa is rising. The last economic frontier. We are making both headlines and front pages in a way that we have not done for decades. So this is a time of tremendous opportunity for Africa. However, this moment must be approached carefully and with strategy. Africa's encounters with the global community in the past have generally produced results that were catastrophic for Africa and disastrous for humankind. We produce slavery, we produce colonialism, we produce neocolonialism, we produce apartheid, and the list goes on. So as a woman who lives and dreams on the continent of Africa, and who has tied her future inextricably to that of Africa, I want us to look very carefully at what is really happening on our continent. We have a situation of an astounding resource base, and paradoxically, a development catastrophe, which is unacceptable for Africa and should be unacceptable for the world. Africa produces a tremendous amount of the world's energy. About 12% of global en energy is produced in Africa. About 13% of global oil is being produced in Africa. And yet, less than 40% of Africans have access to basic electricity. Land has become a global commodity. Africa has an abundance of land. 25% of the land on which food can be grown is on our continent. This has produced land grabbing by Asian companies, European companies, American companies. And while this is going on, one out of every four Africans is undernourished. We are also, and this is the reason we're being called today the uh, last economic frontier, this continent is growing tremendous, tr tremendously um, economically. Seven out of the 10 fastest growing economies within uh, the next five years will be in Africa. And yet, most Africans are like this fisherman from my city in Douala. They work in the informal economy, which means they do not have regular salaries, they do not have health insurance, they do not have retirement benefits, and they generally do not have safe working conditions on a daily basis. So very clearly, we are a very, very wealthy continent. But this wealth is not being translated into wealth for Africans. It's not even being translated into health for Africans. We are, with all of this wealth, not able to provide basic health services to the majority of Africans. So Africa is not poor. It is, however, still, for a very large percentage, poorly run. My country, Cameroon, is a typical example. It is one of the most gorgeous corners of the earth, which I hope you all get a chance to visit someday. Our tourism slogan is Africa in miniature because you can find every ecosystem on the continent in our little national triangle. The, the minerals I just mentioned are all produced in Cameroon. Oil, diamonds, cobalt, you name it, basically, and we have got it. 
and yet 40% of Cameroonians live with less than $2 per day. 60% of Cameroonians do not have access to drinking water. And this is in, a, in an economy that is growing. It has been growing between 3 to 5% for the last 10 years. There is one little factor. We have had the same president for the last 31 years. Maybe there lies the explanation. So it, be, it is to say, stop. We cannot allow this to continue. We must put a stop to big international business and politicians, corrupt African politicians, winning at the expense of everyday Africans. It is to put people back at the center of power. That is the reason that I ran in 2011 for the presidency of Cameroon, and it is the reason that I am still running today. I have decided to put myself at the center of this carrefour where we stand. Africa's possibility, which is the world's opportunity. It is the world's opportunity because we are the world's future. The average worker in Europe and in the United States is 50 years old. The average worker in Asia is 40. The average worker in Latin America is 30. The average worker in Africa is 20 years old. We are the world's thinkers, builders, scientists, future. We cannot afford to get this encounter wrong this time. And we must, in the words of one of the greatest thinkers that our continent ever produced, who was Thomas Sankara, who said, we must be mad enough to dare to invent the future. So we must be mad enough to dare to invent a different kind of future for Africa. And how are we going to do this? We are going to do this by drawing on two aspects, traditional African governance and global modern governance. Contrary to what most people know, including Africans. Traditional African governance holds fantastic principles and models for democracy. One of the things we can learn, if you look at, for example, Yoruba political structures or the political structures of the Fang Beti in Central Africa, you find some of the most inclusive decision-making models that man has ever invented. In the Cameroonian grass fields from where I come, power was always conceived of as being exercised by men and by women. At every level in the society where power is exercised, you find a man and you find his female counterpart. Separation of powers is alive and well, even till today, in traditional African governance. Executive accountability. So if the king did not exercise in a way that held the, people, the interests of the people at heart, that listened to his judiciary and to his legislative bodies, the penalty was death. I think if we had even just the threat of that today, <laughs> Africa would be much better off than it is. We must also learn from global modern governance. We live in such an amazing and tremendous time. People all over the world have decided to occupy government. It has happened in North Africa a few years back and continues to happen today, Tunisia, Egypt, and so on. It is happening in Ghana, it is happening in South Africa, it is happening right here and now in the Ukraine. So we see all over the world people saying that if governments do not take the decisions, if they do not act in a way which is in our interests, then we will occupy 
government. This is a lesson for Africa. Africans must decide on zero tolerance for bad governance. We must decide that we are going to build up those grassroots movements and build up those grassroots leaders. We must decide for Africa, and I believe for the rest of the world, that we, the people, must once again become the building block of society. So, at the Cameroon People's Party, where I work, we have decided to build people power by engaging in political action and bringing about the change we seek. So we invest in women who, for the most part, are not in decision-making circles, like these market women of the Sandaga market, who are learning that not only must they continue to be formidable entrepreneurs, which they already are, but they must understand the political economy. They must understand political structures. They must infiltrate political structures so that decisions that are made there are good for them as women, good for them as entrepreneurs, good for them as community leaders. We are investing in young people because as I've mentioned earlier, young people are the future and we have the youngest population on the planet. These young people have got to understand that politics will run their lives and therefore they must make politics their business. So we've built up a model of political education Overcoming fear, because in many of our countries, fear is a reality and it is justified. Carrying out progressive political action by taking steps towards occupying government and gaining power for people. Overcoming failures, because on this path are many, many failures, even as you gain those steps of success. All of this for us is what is enabling us to steadily build people-powered change for our country and for our continent. Fear is real. If you decide to protest in Cameroon against a bad electoral system because you want a better one, as I did and my colleagues did, uh, in 2011, you will find that you may be beaten, you may be put into jail, as they were, several of them were on that day, or you may find yourself in the middle of the street with the water tr uh, truck trained on you, pouring tons of water onto you, as I was on that day. But something happened in terms of overcoming fear is that I was, as I was standing in the middle of that water, which burns your skin and stings your eyes and smells horrible, smells like rotten eggs. Um, as I was standing in that water, I understood that despite the violence and the brutality which was being rained upon me, I still had power. And that's why I raised my hands in a sign of victory that you see here because I wanted to let my colleagues know and I wanted to let all the people who would be watching know that no matter what type of violence and brutality we face, we still have power. So as Africans, we must renegotiate our relationship with the rest of the world. We must know our history we must take responsibility for our own future. We must dare to invent that future. And we must mobilize the people and strategies that are needed to build and win that future. For the rest of you, there are things you must stop doing. Stop ambiguous behavior with regard to dictators. Stop compromising on democracy and human rights for short-term economic gain. Stop perpetuating a double standard for Africa. And there are things you must start doing. Start building foreign policy that is based on your sustainable interests 
and our sustainable interests. That means pe putting people, the environment, at the center of decision making. You must start supporting grassroots movements and grassroots leaders. And you must step back to let each country fight their own fight at their own pace. It's their future. They have to build it. And finally, you must educate your citizens on the reality of our interdependent world. There is no economic wealth for you. There is no justice for you. There is no peace for you if there is none for me. So I have decided to stand squarely at this corner of Africa's possibility and the world's opportunity. I have decided to be mad enough to dare to invent the future. Will you join me?